Satyam, Jnanam, Anantam, Brahma. If there was anything other than Satyam, Jnanam, Anantam, Brahma, then there would be what? Duality. Clear? Now, uh, Satyam, Jnanam, Anantam, Brahma gets different name with reference to different phenomena. With reference to its capacity to manifest universe, it gets what name? Maya. When the universe uh, comes into manifestation, what does it mean? Time, space and objects become manifest. It gets the name Ishvara, the cause of the universe. When uh, it get, then within the universe there are what many many different forms, and each form does not know that all that is here is one awareness, which is what which has the power to manifest. And it manifests in form of what? Different forms. And all that is here is that. That the, the form which does not know this reality is what? Jiva. So one awareness gets different names. Do you get that? Very easy, right? <laughs> From its capacity to manifest, Maya, with when it actually manifests, uh, then what? The, the, with, uh, it requires what? In order for the whole manifestation to take place, it requires what? Knowledge and power. Not limited knowledge and power, all knowledge and all power. Which was unmanifest before has become manifest. So it gets the name of what? Ishwara, the cause of the universe. Then within this universe, you have many different forms, and the forms don't know the reality. So that means this reality is covered from them. So therefore, they are what? Genius. Just the standpoint is different, but the awareness is the same. Exactly. It's pretty scientific. If you see from a like, quantum physics perspective, it's like, a, I would say, knowledge is information. Uh, it's basically the same, so it's all like uh, it's information and, and, and power, and, and this is like the source of the, of the whole universe, of course, everything is, is like that. Absolutely. So now, the form is unable to figure it out. Form, which is a jiva, is unable to figure the whole thing out by oneself. Why? Because the, the only way jiva can know things is what? through five sense organs. So th through using these five sense organs, you can never figure out. So therefore, you need an independent means of knowledge. I love this mind in the face of, uh, in the face of Anna. It, it inspires me. <laughs> So therefore, uh, uh, what um, uh, you can never figure it out. You then how will you figure it out? Every form is equally ignorant. You need an independent means of knowledge. Where is that independent means of knowledge going to come from? Sure. All knowledge and all power which is not what um, uh, covered by ignorance. What is ignorance for a jiva is what? Shakti for maya. Which shakti? Avarna shakti. Veiling shakti. So that means this all knowledge and all power does not only manifest the universe, it also what? Covers this reality from the understanding of each form. From its own standpoint, from Ishwara's standpoint, it is what? Shakti, the capacity to weigh. From Jiva's standpoint, it becomes what? Avidya, ignorance. 
because you don't know that this is what the reality is. So therefore, you need Ishvara to remove the veil of ignorance. Without Ishvara, it's not possible to remove the veil of ignorance. So that means the means of knowledge comes from Ishvara. If you yourself are first not even aware of the entity, the presence of entity Ishvara, then what does Ishvara first has to tell you? Hey, I'm there. Was it the first Vishi that asked for the knowledge or was it Ishvara that gave it to Vishi? <laughs> both. See, both in the sense that, you know, uh, uh, was the truth revealed to Einstein or Einstein actually worked for it? Both. Both ways. They spent hours thinking through the reality and somewhere they cracked it. Because they did not, the ignorance was revealed. They were the first uh, receivers of So therefore, uh, and then the methodology. So therefore, um, uh, you first it will say, hey, I'm there. So, uh, and in that presence, a lot of uh, jiva's problems which existed because of isolation, not following dharma, all that has to first get well. This is Ishwara's plan. Because you have lived your life not knowing the existence of Ishwara, which gave you the sense of isolation. I see smile now on Stefan's. <laughs> <laughs> I love to see smiling faces. <laughs> no. <laughs> You first have to get well. That is plan. You can't bypass Ishvara all the way. That veil, when is it lifted for you? It's not up to you. You can't decide. Tomorrow I want to be Nani. You may wish, but it may not happen. So therefore, uh, 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 you first need to align to the laws of Ishvara, laws of dharma. You need to get well in terms of your psychology. You need to find your connection with everything else because all forms are manifestation of Ishvara. That is the first job that you need to do before you understand the final equation where Ishvara says not only you are one of the manifestations of this grand design, you and me are the same. Tattvata, in terms of the final reality. Resolution of equation. The individual and what? Which is little Ishvara, which is the cause of the universe, have one common reality. Satyam, Jnana, So therefore, uh, 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 the means of knowledge is from Ishvara. What you have to understand is your identity with Ishvara. For your preparation, you require Ishvara. Because you need to align to the laws of Ishvara. So there is nothing but Ishvara all the way in the pursuit. You can't have Vedanta with awareness, awareness hanging in the air. This is why many people say that some, if Vedanta is not presented properly, something is missing. If you are smart, you can figure it out. Something is not in place. It 
it's not complete, it doesn't fit. When somebody says it exactly as it is, even though you may not totally understand it, it takes time. It takes time. But it, if you are a discerning human being, it makes sense. So therefore, uh, uh, this is when the knowledge is complete. Otherwise, it's just what? Three different parts which are not combined together to have this combination. Now, Let's go, he talks a little bit more, uh, yeah, one more thing that I really wanted to explain which is so important because uh, I think probably I didn't understand uh, Sandy's question and uh, then Gabi came to me after the class and uh, the question of uh, Sandy was, is Ishwara the object? That was your question, right? And I said no and it is true that Ishwara is not the object. Then Gabi came and said, yeah, but all the objects that you see here are what? Ishwara. So, what you need to understand is this very critical, very critical. Uh, that while the objects are not separate from Ishwara, Ishwara is not only the objects. Satya Mithya relationship. Otherwise, what will happen is, Ishwara itself will become all the objects. Then, it is, uh, where is time and space coming from? Then, time and space is not separate from Ishwara, but Ishwara is not time and space. This is why, before time and space, an object world comes, Ishwara is there as a potential, which is what? Maya. All knowledge and all power not yet manifesting as the universe. This is what we mean by Satya Mithya relationship. If you make object as the, the other thing and this as this, you, the, the, there is a fundamental confusion. Why object is not independent uh, of Ishwara, Ishwara is not any of the objects. While time and space is not independent of Ishwara, Ishwara is what? Not time and space. So when it's once decided it's getting boring without any manifestation and then it is <laughs> 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 so there is a kind of a cycle, yeah. So manifestation and unmanifestation. What happens in unmanifestation is, see, all the jivas have causal, causal, which is the account, which is all the karmas. In the manifest universe, that what the physical and subtle body come into being, through which you see other forms and you interact with other forms. In the unmanifest, what remains is the causal. This is why the jiva doesn't disappear. Even if there is no physical and subtle body, the causal body remains unmanifest. This is why for a jiva, there is no way to get out of what they call samsara. The only way to get out of samsara is through knowledge. Because when the universe becomes unmanifest, what remains, what doesn't, uh, what, uh, what doesn't uh, manifest is what the physical and subtle body, but the account still remains. Which then, when the universe manifests again, the, it starts again. It's in the Panchadasi, right? Sorry? Panchadasi is about that. Pancha what? <coughs> Panchadasi. 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 Oh, Panchadasi. Panchadashi. Yeah, Panchadashi has many chapters and it talks about all kinds of things. So this is why the event when Jiva comes to Vedanta is a very, very important. 
important event in life of a jiva. Why? Because the jiva is anadi. There is no beginning. It continues through cycle of creation because Ishvara is anadi. In any lifetime that you come to Vedanta and that you come to a teacher who knows Vedanta, you don't know what blessing. You can't even, you may think I am just coming to Witsenhausen for a retreat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, should I go or should I go to Switzerland for a holiday? That's a choice. some annual holiday, I don't have anything else to do, let's go to Vedanta. Mm -hmm. You have some grace, for sure. So therefore, uh, that is life, because it is anadi, and it is, it is not ananta. It can only end when you get this knowledge. So therefore, this is a very significant event in life of a human being. Now, he uh, explains a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, the, the nature of uh, Ishvara a little bit more from different standpoints so that if you have not totally understood what Sarva Jnana, Sarva Shakti Man means, then he explains from different standpoints. Because before you get this final knowledge, you really, as Surya nicely says, you first need to settle account with Ishwara. So therefore, in order to settle account with Ishwara, you need to know the nature of Ishwara well. So a couple of more vo uh, verses about Ishwara. No, quite a few more verses. Let's look. Manta <coughs> Parataram Nanyata Kinchitasti dhananjaya mai sarvamidam protam sutre manikana iva. He uses an imagery. Even this, uh, Krishna knows how to use an imagery. Because people find it difficult to understand concepts, but when there are imageries, it becomes easier. So here he first makes a statement, matta param Parataram nanya kinchit asti dhananjaya. There is nothing here in this universe other than me. Mai sarvam idam protam. In me, everything is what woven. Uh, what? How? Sutre mani ganagiva. What does it mean? Mani means all the jewels or the beads. And then there is one string which puts together what? All the beads. What, uh, what does this imagery say to you? What represents the thread and what represents the beads? The beads are what? Jiva's <laughs> 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 object. Huh? Yeah, exactly. The beads are uh, many, many different objects. You can either take it as all the different jivas as beads, right? Or you can take different objects like what mountains, rivers, this, that. Or you can take objects as what galaxies, uh, uh, stars, sun, moon. So this, in this imagery, the different objects which includes different jivas are what the, the beads. Then what stands for the thread? All penetrating elements. Sorry? All penetrating elements. Uh, and, and all penetrating awareness is the final thing, but here when he is talking about Ishwara, interconnectedness. Wonderful. Very good. So, how are all the forms interconnected through what? Through the laws. Ishwara. Through the laws. Mm. So, that means the string represents what? All the laws of the universe. So that means Ishvara, the all knowledge and all power. Right now we are not yet talking about awareness. We are talking about what? Ishvara. Sarvajnaha, Sarvashaktiman, Ishvara. 
he says, I'm all the forms and I'm also what all the laws which connect what each form. Which laws, can, uh, uh, what are the laws which connect you and me? What are the laws of the universe which connect you and me and everything else and us to everything else? Physical laws. What are the physical laws? The physical laws means that we can stand on this earth and not fall down. <laughs> that the earth doesn't collide with all the other planets. This is what we call the physical laws. Need not only you, your form is governed by physical laws, my form is equally governed by physical laws. And the stars are also governed by physical laws. So this is what the string represents, not only physical laws, what biological laws. What does it mean? Just as your <laughs> body needs water, my body also needs water and food. This is part of the plan laws. Nobody can <laughs> bypass it. So that means that this is whole plant kingdom. Which is not just, the trees are not meant for you to just chop. <laughs> I, I live in a nice neighborhood in Bombay. One day, and there was a beautiful uh, champa tree, which is frangipani tree, and I saw them cutting it. No, not, uh, not was it? Bougainville. A bougainville. Yeah, bougainville. And they were chopping it. So I said, why are you chopping such a beautiful, lovely tree? It was an old one. Old, old one. one. Just beautiful. Gorgeous red. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, why are you chopping it? You know what? The answer, I was almost shocked. He is telling me, yeah, because, you know, sometimes uh, it was so huge and some, uh, uh, the, the owner of the next building has a van, which is a little high. So he says, my van cannot <laughs> pass through, so he's chopping the whole tree. <laughs> <laughs> So therefore, uh, this is how we are. We don't understand. We just live only from our, my, me and myself, little self-interest. So therefore, this bio, the trees are not just hanging around there and inconvenient for you. They do a big job of producing food for you and oxygen for you. So that is what we call biological laws. Then, which other law? Physiological laws. Physiological laws means, now Shan tells me this morning that he has a little machine. And that machine, how do you, you connect it? Where do you connect no, you it? You just hold it in your hand and it has so many parameters. How many? 220. Huh? 220. 220. It will give an analysis of what, how is your, what, everything, right? Your <laughs> <laughs> so that means that this is what we call physiological laws. Only because there are physiological laws, you can have a machine like this. They can measure everything. So that is what we call physiological laws. Then you have what? Psychological laws. What does it mean? It means that if somebody is kind to you and smiles at you, you will feel inspired. And if somebody is sleeping in your class, then... <laughs> That's why sometimes Swamiji used to get all the interested students who have bright shining eyes to come and sit in front because he says, I need to be inspired. <laughs> so this is how it is, you know, this music concert you go to, 
especially Indian classical music, which if you don't know how the ragas work, it may sound like, what is it, ah, ah, you know? <laughs> So therefore, uh, 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 sometimes there are very famous artists who give uh, concerts, and uh, the people who get the first seat is what the sponsors. So sponsors means big, big companies and all. So then they send their executives because they have all these donor passes. So they, the executives who have no clue about music, they all sit in front and they're in their mobile, <laughs> silent mobile looking there. And the artist is certainly not inspired. So therefore, <laughs> this is what we call laws of psychology. Nobody can avoid it. Then you have what we call a, a laws of, in addition to all these laws, you have two critical laws. In addition to all these are manifestation of Ishwara. Two more laws. Which one? The laws of dharma and laws of karma. So therefore, the string which connects us all is the series of laws. So therefore, uh, please understand that this karma, you have to understand clearly. You think that only uh, the, you experience, please understand, because that was Matthew's question yesterday, from the story of this forged coupon, it seems, it, uh, we think that karma, law of karma means we experience what the result only of our action. In that story, what was happening? That one father made the decision and the effect was seen where? In the shopkeeper's life, in what? The peasant's life. And we think that this is not karma. Hey, it is part of karma. What does it mean? You live in an interconnected world. An interconnected world means every action that you choose has what? Effects on not only one individual, it affects many individuals. They have to what? Experience the result of your choices. And the extent to which you disturb the whole system of things, to that extent, you will get what? Your result back. That means, right now, you are not only affected directly only by your karma. Suppose you have a, a girlfriend, suppose, then how she got treated by her mother or father is going to influence how she interacts with you. So that means you are not just experiencing what? The, your causes. You are also experiencing what? The causes which are created by what? Somebody else who is carrying forward. And that person, again, her parents, how she treated uh, her, is again influenced by what? Her parents and her parents. So this is why it becomes highly complex. The web of connections makes it highly complex. At any given point in time, you can't be just experiencing what? Your things, you are constantly experiencing what? The, uh, the, uh, that's why it becomes difficult. That's why you can't control everything. Because you can't go and change the mother of your girlfriend. And you can't also go and change uh, the, the, uh, the grandmother. That's why, uh, essentially, there are unknown variables and you are helpless. This is a fact. 
unknown variables not only created by your own life but all the lives of all the others who are around you. And what the, the story of forged coupon says is A. B. The only part it is not showing is that the one person performs an action and it has multiple repercussions. As a result of that choice, what is the effect that comes back to the father that is not shown? That is what we call law of karma. But your actions not only affect you, it affects multiple people. And the result that you are going to get then is depending upon the number of people either you help or you created what disturbance. Mm -hmm. This is why if you raise a good child, you do not only service to yourself, but to the child, but to his wife and to his children and to his posterity, you are affecting so many lives with your good proper choices. And the other way, if you make irresponsible choices, you are affecting many individuals and you are disturbing the whole. The whole network gets weakened. And the results of that not only are experienced by others, but then ultimately they come back to you. And who arranges it all? Ishwara, the laws. Law of dharma and karma. So therefore, this sutre mani gana iva. Ishwara is what? The string which puts together what? All the beads. Now, the next verse says, you may think that, oh, Ishwara is only the laws. So, the next verse, what immediately says, it's not only the strings, it is also what the beats, also the forms are Ishwara. Not only the laws are Ishwara, also the forms which are subject and the laws are also manifestation of Ishwara. So, the next verse says, Raso mamap sukam teya, Prabhas vishashi surya yoho, Pranava sarva vedeshu, Shabda ke paurushon, Paurusham drushu. So here he says that, Hey Arjuna, that he says, I am uh, uh, not only uh, uh, the, the laws, I am also raso aham apsu kon teya. Right? So not only I am the, the, the forms, uh, I'm not only the laws, I'm also the forms. What are the forms? Different objects that are there in the universe. And rasaha. Rasaha means their attributes. So that means every form has a specific function. The function of fire is different from function of water. Function of water is different from function of air. So that means, and each of us as a human being has what a different role to play because we are all born with different skills, different resources in a different context. So therefore, the forms and the specificities of the forms also I am. So the same uh, knowledge and power which manifests the laws also manifests what? The different forms and their with their specific attributes. Raso ham apsu kaunteya prabha asmi shashi surya yogo. So both the sun and the moon give rise to the shine but the shine is what? Different. The sun gives what? The heat. And the moon is what? Cooling. This is why if you uh, uh, go to Ayurveda system, some of the medicines, uh, what they do is, they keep overnight with the moonlight. They need moonlight. Because when they are exposed to moonlight, they will produce what? Different qualities. <laughs> 
So therefore, not only the, uh, the, 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 the forms which is sun and the moon are me. The sun does the job of photosynthesis, raising uh, what, uh, uh, providing you water by evaporating the sea uh, water. And the moon does what job? All the ocean and the what? Tides. Tides. Each one has a different placement, different function, different attributes. So that means I am also all the forms and the act different attributes of the form which are all connected to make the universe what it is. Then what I am what pranamaha sarva vedeshu. I am also that omkara uh, in all the Vedas and khe paurusham drushu. Okay, I am the sound, I am shabda in the space. I am the one which enables what? The sound to travel through the space. And also I am the strength in human beings. Not only the form human being, but also what? This, uh, the, uh, the amazing um, upadhi which is the human. Why among all the different forms, a human form is considered to be an exalted form? All the forms are beautiful. You just uh, open uh, the National Geographic and you observe anything. And you read a little bit about any animal. It's all a wonder. They're all very intelligent. And they seem to have an easier life because what my sister when I was young, she said, monkeys have a good life. They keep jumping from one thing to the other. They have no worries. And they seem happy. Right? Whereas human life seems to be full of struggle. So why is it that the human life is so much praised in Shastra? Human life is praised in Shastra because human brain can solve this problem of the fundamental human problem. It has, it has capacity, the capacity of the brain is so advanced that it can not only see anything in the world and try to figure it out. Complex things like how old is the universe? Right? What is black hole? All this it can figure out. It's not an ordinary brain. But the same brain which can figure out all of that can also figure out what? The absolute reality. That possibility is given. This is why a human being is exalted. Human birth is exalted. So a jiva, which is this, in your causal body, it's not that you will only get what? Human birth. The causal body in, consists of so many different uh, unseen results. You can take birth as any species. It's not that you only come back as human being. So this is why they say that, hey, once you have human birth, human birth, but moksha is the possibility. And if you don't collapse that possibility, it's a waste. You spend your time doing this, you're getting that, little things here, little things there, and one day, out. So therefore, uh, that the human being and the possibilities that are given to human being are also my mind. So, now we understood Ishvara is what? The forms, the unique attributes that the forms enjoy and also the laws which what? Uh, put together all the forms. What does it mean? Ishvara <coughs> is the maker and the material cause of the universe. There is, uh, because as uh, in the case of uh, uh, this, 
uh, Lutz had said, not only you need a pot maker, you also need what? The clay, the material from which the pot is made. Ishvara is what? The all knowledge and the uh, power from which the whole universe has come. And what is the material from which Ishvara manifests the universe? Time itself. Means that intelligence first brings about what? These little tiniest particles. That's why when you try to find the content, you can't find the content. Ultimately, it goes back to intelligence. And then it organized that further to make subsequent objects. So, Ishvara is maker and the material. In Sanskrit, it is called Abhinna Nimitta Upadhanakara. Upadhanakara means that it is Nimitta and Upadhanakara, maker and the material cause of the universe. So now, you think that uh, you know the nature of Ishvara pretty well, but uh, there is another set of verses which talk a little bit more about nature of Ishvara. Yadaksharam veda vido vadanti vishanti yadyata yovita ragaha yadichanto brahmacharyam charanti Tatte padam sangrahe na pravakshe omitye kaksharam brahma vyaharan mamanus maran yaprayati pyajan deham sayati paramangatim. So these two verses I'm going to do together because in the first verse only uh, uh, kind of praises uh, uh, one thing. And that is Omkara. So now, through this word Om, the nature of Ishvara is re explained. Om, you know? Yes, everybody knows Om. <laughs> now, uh, one thing is if you were to explain. This all knowledge and all power, which is all forms and every, uh, uh, every, uh, every, everything in the universe, then what kind of uh, the definitions you would need? Very what elaborate definitions, as I've been explaining to you for last I don't know how many hours. What is Ishvara? Now the the uh, uh, the, the shastra has an ingenious method of explaining what is the entire nature of Ishvara through one word. And what is that? Om. How? There is Mandukya Upanishad which uses Om and shows, reveals the nature of Ishvara. The word Om consists of three things. Akara, Ukara and Makara. What is Akara? Akara stands for the waking world, the physical objects. Because as I had just explained, Ishvara includes all the forms. Generally you think the forms are only what? What you see which are what? Physical forms. So Ishvara is what all the physical forms of the universe that is represented by what? Akara. Now all the physical forms include what your physical form. So that means this Akara itself is divided in what? Vyashti and Samashti. What is Vyashti and what is Samashti? My physical form which is Vyashti and all other physical forms which is what? Samashti. So, Akara stands for all the physical forms which includes my form and what? All the other physical forms. That is the intelligence which creates the physical forms. Akara. What is Ukara? 
there is not only physical forms in the universe. I have told you there is what the sun. So therefore, this subtle also, which is what my subtle body, that is uh, the, uh, and what the subtle bodies of everybody else, every other living being. So Ishvara is the intelligence which not only makes my, what is constituting of subtle body, we saw it. What, what, I'll remind again, what, the capacity of your five sense organs, the capacity of your five uh, uh, pranas, the four, four functions of your mind, and what, the organs of action. This is what we call the capacity. One is what, the uh, physical hand, the other one is what we saw, the capacity of hand to move which is subtle. One thing is physical eye, then the second thing is what? The capacity of your eyes to see, which is subtle. Because just by looking at your eyes, I have no idea how much your eyes can see. That's why it's subtle. Only you know. And then it is pancha prana. What are pancha prana? Inhaling, exhaling, digestion, circulation, evacuation. This is what we call pancha prana. And then four functions of the mind. What are the four functions? Manas, buddhi, ahankara and chitta. The other species may not have such a developed mind, right? They, their functions are a little bit less and impaired. I mean, more blocked. Uh, but uh, the subtle body of me and subtle body of everyone is manifestation of Ishwara. The same intelligence which brings about physical forms also brings out what? Mani brings into manifestation what? The subtle forms. Ukara. Akara, Ukara. What else is remaining? What Makara stands for? As we saw, each physical and subtle body, what is because of, it's not that somehow randomly you got this body and this mind and I got randomly, it's because of what the causal. The causal of me and causal of everyone else is what? Makara. So the word Om includes everything. Everything means itself. We have such a limited understanding of what everything means. So therefore, when you say Ishvara is everything, it means all the physical bodies that exist now, that existed in the past, that will ever exist in the future. All the subtle bodies that existed in the past, in the present and in the future. Starting from this, uh, Surya said, unicellular or, 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 yeah, organism, which began to have this whole sense of I, that is subtle. A very ancient primitive brain, that also is manifestation of Ishwara. So that means the subtle of the past, present and future. And also known to me and unknown to me. There are so many. I don't even know whether in the other planets where there are, if there is life or not. And what kind of forms are there. So it all includes everything. And finally, the causal. The series of causes which gives you this birth at this given point in time. 
and also what gives all of you the birth and the fact that the causes which bring us together, the whole causal of the universe is nothing but Ishwara. The intelligence which includes everything. This is why in the unmanifest universe, there is what is the difference the, phys the physical and subtle is not there, but the causal is, Makara is still there, which is the causal, which is not yet manifesting as what? Subtle and physical. Ishvara includes the intelligence which includes everything. This is why your existence here is connected to what? The extinction of dinosaurs. How? Because as long as there were dinosaurs on this earth, mammals could not survive. They would eat up mammals. And because those, uh, the dinosaurs became extinct, the mammals started surviving on this earth. There is a series of laws that connect your existence to that event. <coughs> and that is what we call in the cause of the series of cause and effect which doesn't work within the time period of 1500 years. If you think about the manifest universe, the series of cause and effect starts with the manifestation of universe, but before that it is what? In the unmanifest. We all carry our thoughts. So therefore, this is Ishwara. So that generally you think, oh now I understand what Ishwara is. Now I understand what Ishwara is. What it does is keeps on what building on it and makes you see what layers and layers and layers of ignorance just keeps removing. Now the next This is a very nice verse, uh, which um, is, I will first read it out. Maya tatamidam sarvam jagadavyakta murtina masthani sarva bhutani nachaham tveshva vasthitaha nachamasthani bhutani pashyame yoga vaishwanam Bhuta Brunna Cha Bhuta Staha Mamatma Bhuta Bhavana Excellent words. Now, the problem here, if you are really smart, you will ask a question. Oh, Ishvara is everything all the physical forms, all the subtle forms, all uh, the, what, the causals, right? So now, uh, that means Ishvara is what also what? Uh, the thief, the murderer, the terrorist. Because the world includes all the physical and subtle body, doesn't include all the saints. Then you can ask the question, if Ishwara is all these thieves and murderers and uh, terrorists, why should I pray to that Ishwara? Yes, 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 sure. <laughs> 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 why should I? Because the question where does evil come from? Exactly. It's the source of root of evil. Super. <laughs> It's very important. It's question. very important. <laughs> so that means in a real Vedanta, that is the whole teaching to be Even if you don't ask questions, we raise questions. <laughs> <laughs> and then we answer that to give you clarity. So 
So therefore, now everybody is getting all of us, all of us that are interested. Yeah, how do I start this? It's a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> because if you say it's all Ishvara, then it's like a kind of difficult. Exactly, <laughs> kind of difficult. You get into, I got it myself into trouble. Back to yeah. this question. Uh, isn't it the absence of the knowledge of Ishvara which makes it deep and deep? Yeah, like ignorance. And karma. So now, what you need to understand is that we, the, the uh, see, um, it's nice to hear Ishvara is all love. It ni it's nice to hear. But when you make a statement like that, you get into trouble. Why do you get into trouble? Because anybody can ask you that if Ishvara is all love, why did he create this world? Which is, I see more of suffering in this world than love. I see more of problems and fighting than love. And if Ishwara not only created this world, but is also manifesting as uh, the whole universe, then Ishwara is what all of this, a criminal, a thief, uh, everything, murderer, then why should you pray to that Ishwara? Carl Jung had that question. He said, you are telling me Ishwara is all love, all kindness, all beautiful, uh, right? And then I, when I see the world, is it what? Or this is an act of kindness? And then he says, then you said, okay, no, no, Ishwara is really good. Then there is another force. <laughs> Contradicting. Which is evil. And that is creating problem. Because Ishwara is good. Can't do this. Then he Totally. Duality. Correct. Now, then you need to create the other entity called evil or devil or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> Asura, whatever. Ariman. <laughs> and then, what will happen? Then again he says, okay, you think you've answered the question. Jung is pretty smart. He says, Hey, this Ishwara of yours seems to be constantly struggling with this evil. And who seems to have an oh, oh, upper hand? <laughs> the devil. The evil. So he says, now that means even this Ishwara who is finding oneself little power, powerless, and the evil seems to be having an upper hand, seems to be just as helpless and weak like me. Why should I pray? Kalyum. He was not. He was not dumb. So therefore, then you need to answer that question. And the answer to that question is, as I told you, you can't give any attributes to Ishwara other than Sarvadna Sarvashaktina. If you give any other attribute, you will get into trouble. The definition of Ishwara is all knowledge and all power. It doesn't have goodness or badness as such. It brings into manifestation what? The whole universe. And through Maya Shakti, what it covers what? This reality. That is how the nature of Ishwara is. Now, under the influence of ignorance, how you exercise, the jiva exercises what the choice which is based on free will, which is what, as Shan said, what you do under the influence of Amitya. You are given possibilities. Your, in your brain is given the understanding of dharma. 
if you were not given in your brain the understanding of dharma, then Ishwara is a sadist. You are given the understanding of dharma in your brain, knowing very well what is right and what is wrong. But along with that, you are also given possibilities. And if you choose to go against dharma, then what? the laws which are infallible give you the consequences. So therefore, Ishwara doesn't have the attribute of being what? Mean, terrorist. It doesn't have that attribute. It is, Ishwara is in form of what? The intelligence which manifests the world with the laws and possibilities. And every time you collapse a possibility, there is a consequence in keeping with the laws. So this is exactly, so don't blame Ishwara for all these so-called problems that you see in the world. This is why this Satya-Mithya relationship you have to understand. Otherwise, you will get into trouble. See, any mistake you make in understanding the vision correctly will lead to disaster if you are talking to somebody who is intelligent. Understand. Let's look at this example. The example of somebody who is not following dharma. Right? Or let's take one emotion. And what is that emotion? The emotion of, let's say, sadness. Let's say. So, what is Ishwara? Ishwara is in form of what? The, 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 in order for the experience of sadness to happen, you need what? Ticking of, you first need uh, what? Some kind of an input from outside or some memory that uh, uh, you have which gets uh, arise in your mind. For which requires what? A lot of activities of neurons. Right? And also the chemical connections, the electric connections, everything. Now, the sadness is what the nature of thought. Can you attribute sadness to neurons? You can't. Can you attribute the sadness to the uh, truth of the neurons, which is what? Neurons are brain cells, so they must have atoms, molecules. molecules. Can you attribute sadness? No. You can't attribute. Mithya is such that there is this experience of Dukkha which cannot exist without what? Chemicals, electrical and neuro, neuron and coming together of that. But the Dukkha cannot be, uh, what? It's not part of any of the three. The neurons themselves are what? Nothing but atoms and atoms are nothing but particles. And what is Ishwara? Ishwara is the intelligence which puts all of this together and doesn't become what it manifests. Satya-Mithya relationship is like that. While atom is not independent of Ishwara, Ishwara is independent of being atom. That's why it can become a cell. While cell is not independent of being Ishwara, Ishwara is independent of being cell. Satya Mithya relationship, if you don't understand, you will start thinking that Ishwara has all the problems that exist in the world because Ishwara is everything. The 
attributes belong to pot, attributes don't belong to the tail. So, he makes a statement what that what maya tatam idam sarvam jatat avyakta murtika. By me, everything is pervaded. Matsthani sarvabhuta. No either object, phenomena, laws, nothing can exist without me. But na cha aham teshu avastita. Means, I am not affected by what happens at the level of forms. Satya mitya relationship. Like the clay saying, the, the whole of pot is pervaded by me, but the size of the pot, or the shape of the pot, or the function of the pot, doesn't affect me at all. True statement of fact. Pervading everything, it is free from everything. Otherwise, Ishwara will become the most afflicted entity. <laughs> Because you have only your sorrows, Ishwara's sorrows will be what? Everybody else's sorrow will be loaded on to Ishwara. So, then he says, Nacha masthani bhutani pashyame yogam aishwara. This is the, the, the final reality. Bhuta brunna cha bhuta staha vamatma bhuta bhuta. He moves, first he says that I pervade everything, but none of the attributes that, of the forms that I pervade belong to me. That is the first statement. Second he says that Nachamasthani Bhutani. Now he shifts from what? The all knowledge and all power to the Swarupa of Ishwara and that is what? Awareness. From the standpoint of the awareness, is there any creation? Is there any creation? All that is here is just one awareness. Everything else is just appearance. So therefore he says, if I speak from my own standpoint, I am not even pervaded by anything. <coughs> All that is here is It is like while in the dream, if you understand that this whole dream world, which consists of what? The dream mountain, dream river, dream characters, dream building. None of it can exist without the presence of your awareness. But is your awareness really becoming the mountain? or the rivers, or the characters, if it became all of that, when you wake up, you'll be waking up with mountains <laughs> and rivers. So with reference to your own dream, you can say that, that everything that you see in the dream world is pervaded by me. But I am what, with reference to myself, I am what, neither river, nor the <coughs> rock, nor the characters. In fact, there is nothing other than awareness. There is no second thing at all. That awareness has not undergone any change, real change, to become all of this. So this reality, Ishwara knows that what? That Ishwara is what? Sarvajnaha, Sarva Shaktiman. But what is the truth of Ishwara? What is the eye of Ishwara? Satyam, Jnanam, Anantam, Brahma. Knows it. You don't know it. That's why they teach it. One is the Upadhi and one is the Swarupa. This is why in our Shastra, I don't want to know that you become too technical. Become very technical. Okay, so therefore, uh, uh, this is how 
from the standpoint of its capacity, as I told you, it's only one awareness. From the standpoint of its capacity to project, it is Maya. And when the universe is manifest, it is Ishvara, the cause of the universe. But from its own standpoint, it is what? Only awareness. So, here he says that this is my Aishwara. Now, Bhuta Bhunnacha Bhuta Staha Mamatma Bhuta. So that means that uh, I produce all the beings, sustain all the beings, but um, does not exist depending upon these beings. And in fact, in reality, they don't exist at all. Now, uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit, there are five, ten minutes, I want to talk a little bit about um, the, the fact that when we talk about Maya, we talk about this capacity to manifest, we don't mean illusion. We don't mean imagination. We don't mean anything subjective. Because this universe is not subjective. It is empirically true. You can't be dismiss it saying that it is dream of Ishwara. This is not true. or it's an imagination of Ishwara, it's not true. So therefore, what we say is, Mithya, which means what? Dependent reality, is sub further subdivided in two categories. What are the two categories of Mithya? What is the definition of Mithya? That which has a dependent existence. That is divided in two categories and one is what we call Vyavaharika, the empirical reality and the other one is what? Pratibhasika, the subjective reality. What is an example of an empirical reality? This spot, is it, empiric, is it an imagination? No, it's not an imagination. Don't take it as an imagination. If you call it imagination, that's when the tendency to just not pay attention. It's just like an excuse. It is just, it becomes, a, the whole of Vedanta becomes an excuse. Like an escape. This is why people who did not understand Shankaracharya, they call him Mayavadi. Mayavadi means the person who just says the world is what Mithya and it is because of Maya and he's just dismissing the world. He was not dismissing the world. They didn't understand what Shankara was saying. Mithya does not mean a subjective reality or an illusion. It means it has a dependent reality and within dependent reality there are two subcategories. One is empirically true, which is like this pot. Why is this pot empirically true? It exists. It exists. It's not some imagination. This pot is not an imagination. It does exist. And as Anna says, her name is Anne. She says, oh, she keeps telling me Anna. But <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so, uh, what is the definition of empirical reality? That it is, therefore I see it. That is empirically true. In Sanskrit, it is called Vyavaharika. Vyavaharika means empirically true. Now, uh, 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 but it is still not absolutely real because it has what dependent existence. Now, within this dependent existence, there is another type of uh, uh, subcategory and that is what Pratipasika. What is Pratipasika? Pratipasika is your subjective reality. The classic example of subjective reality is what? 
rope snake. That imagine it is dark and you go to a forest and you see something long and of that width. Then you may be what? Oh my God. And why like this? Because you may see that there is snake. Why is snake called Mithya? Tell me. The snake is called Mithya because it has a dependent reality. It depends upon the snake that you see, depends upon what for its existence? Rope. If there was no rope, you would not see the snake. That's why it also is dependent reality. But you can't think about the rope snake as pot. The snake doesn't have the same order of reality as what? The pot. The pot is empirically true. The snake is what? Your projection. It is your imagination. So that means uh, that is what we call subjective reality. Subjective reality you can call it as imagination. But empirical reality, you can't call it an imagination. Can you call it anything that has a form is empirical reality? No. no. Uh, anything that has a form in the sense that, see, the, the, the thought is also a form. So the mm -hmm. snake thought is a form, but it is not empirical. I mean, the snake is not empirical. Mm -hmm. Like the mirage, mirage uh, the example in the desert. Yeah. So, is, is also like yes, you see water where there is no water. Right? So that means now what happens is uh, in Mithya, there are two kinds of Mithya. One is what? Uh, what is and it is, therefore you see it. That is Vyavaharika, empirically true. The second reality is what? I see it, therefore it is. Snake rope. I see the snake, so for me, there is snake. But both is dependent. But both is, is dependent, dependent. Yeah. means both come under the category of Mithya. Yeah. So now, when we live in this Mithya world, this has a big implication. Not only we see things which are there, but because of our ignorance, what? When somebody doesn't smile at me, Oh, that person doesn't like me. This is which one? Vyavaharika or Pratibhasika? Pratibhasika. So that means when I live in the world, everything is mixed up for me. The absolute reality, which is Paramarthika, Paramarthika is the absolute reality, is totally missed out. Look at this. Totally is nowhere in my understanding. Like the reference point is missing. Yes. Then what is empirically true seems to be the absolute reality. The pot seems to be the absolute reality. And then sometimes even the snake that I see seems to be an absolute reality. Pratipasika also seems like Parmatika. So that means we all live with a huge reality confusion. So we don't have a reality check. <laughs> Vedanta is a reality check. You, you become sane only when you come to Vedanta. That's uh, Swamiji used to say. That there are some people who are abnormally abnormal. <laughs> and there are some other people who are what Just abnormally normal. no uh, normally abnormal. <laughs> but we are all off because we have we live with reality confusion.
what is the truth is totally missed out. What is empirically true is taken as absolute reality. But unfortunately, sometimes our own projections, our own uh, subjective things are also taken as absolute reality. So it's all a mix up. And when we live with that mix up, and everybody else lives with that mix up, life becomes complicated. <laughs> It's hard to navigate in such a reality. I mean, without it's hard to navigate. Yeah. Absolutely. Because if even if you want to be good, <laughs> you can't change everybody else. Yeah, and you can't trust even the scientific, no? because the world is it's flat. This, is, no? this example, no? what you see is the world is flat. So there is nobody who can tell you what's the truth. Yeah. So that's why you need Shastra. What's about a dream? When I see the pot in the dream, is that an Yeah, creature? so when you see a pot in the dream, it is only you see it, others don't see okay. it, therefore it is falling in subjective. The whole of dream experience mm -hmm. that you have is subjective. Mm -hmm. This is why we don't call it Ishwara's dream. It's not a subjective reality, what we see here. Mm -hmm. It is empirically true. You can give an example, but it is not totally corresponding. So, uh, uh, this is uh, what I wanted to show because it's very important. Please don't think or try to define Maya as either an illusion or some kind of a magic, or some kind of a, you know, uh, the Ishwara is trying to fool us, it's not that. It's just the manifesting capacity. Now, uh, the next couple of verses I will do uh, uh, tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you.